Welcome to Lesson 11D, More Solutions of the Navier-Stokes Equation. In this lesson, we'll do two more examples of exact solutions of the Navier-Stokes Equation. One will be in Cartesian coordinates and the other in cylindrical coordinates. Our first example is an oil film falling on a vertical wall. Our coordinate system is x to the right, y into the page, and z up. Gravity is acting down. The surface of the oil is vertical, exposed to atmospheric pressure air. This wall is fixed, and the oil properties are rho and mu. The thickness of the film is h. This oil is falling by gravity alone. There's no pressure gradient forcing the flow. We want to calculate the velocity and pressure fields in the oil. We'll neglect changes in hydrostatic pressure in the air. To solve this, we apply our step-by-step -step procedure. Step one is to identify the flow geometry and domain. We'll set our domain as some section of this oil film. The height of this domain doesn't really matter. So by looking at the diagram, we've completed step one. Step two is to list assumptions, approximations, and boundary conditions. Number one, the wall is infinite in the yz plane. That's up and down and into the page. In other words, there's nothing different here than here. This is another way of saying that the flow is fully developed. Number two, the flow is steady, so del del t of anything is zero. Number three, u is zero everywhere. Number four, the fluid is incompressible in Newtonian and laminar. Number five, we already mentioned that the atmospheric pressure is constant at the free surface. If we don't worry about hydrostatic pressure in the air, then p equal p atm everywhere. Number six, the velocity field is purely two-dimensional. This means that v equals zero, and all partial derivatives with respect to y are zero. Number seven, the only component of gravity is in the negative z direction. We can write out our boundary conditions. At the vertical wall, there's no slip, so all three components of velocity are zero at the wall, which is at x equals zero in our coordinate system. At the free surface, this is an interface, and we'll assume that mu oil is much greater than mu air. So we apply the derivative boundary condition, del w del x equals zero, at x equal h. In other words, in this film, we expect the velocity profile to go to zero slope at the free surface. We already said that p equal p atmosphere everywhere, so we don't need any other boundary conditions. Step three is to list all appropriate differential equations and unknowns and to simplify. For continuity, u is zero by assumption three, v is zero by six, so this reduces to del w del z equals zero. I'll call that equation one. Next, we look at the x-momentum equation, the x-component of the Navier-Stokes equation. Approximation 3 tells us that u is zero everywhere, so all its derivatives must also be zero. There's no gravity in the x-direction, and pressure is constant everywhere. So the x-momentum equation is exactly satisfied. It reduces to zero equals zero. In the y-direction, which is into the page, v is zero by approximation 6, which gets rid of all these terms, and there's no gravity in the y direction by assumption seven. So the y momentum equation also is perfectly satisfied in this problem. Now we look at the z momentum equation. This flow is steady. U is zero. V is again zero. W is not zero, but del W del z is zero by our continuity result. Again, pressure is constant. There is gravity in the z direction, so we leave that in. In fact, it's negative rho g. W is a function of x, so we'll leave this term in, but by 6, this term goes away. Again, by continuity, equation 1, the last term goes away. So the z-momentum equation reduces to del squared w del x squared is rho g over mu. But w is not a function of time by approximation 2. It's not a function of y by approximation 6. And it's not a function of z because of our continuity equation. In other words, w is a function only of x, so we can use total derivatives instead. And this is our final simplified equation, resulting from the z-momentum equation. Step four is to solve the system of equations. We have only one left, which we can easily integrate. Integrating once, we add a constant of integration. And integrating again, we add another constant of integration. So this is our equation for w, the z-velocity component. What remains is to apply the boundary conditions to find c1 and c2. At x equals 0, we know that w equals 0 by the no-slip condition. So 0 equals 0 plus 0 plus c2, so c2 must be 0. Our other boundary condition was that at x equals h, the interface with the air, dw dx is 0. Again, we can use total derivatives instead of partial derivatives. 
from this equation, dw dx is 0, and that's equal to rho g over mu times h, when x is h, plus c1, which we can solve for c1. It's negative rho g h over mu, and thus w becomes rho g x over 2 mu times the quantity x minus 2 h. We get this by plugging in the two constants and doing a little bit of algebra to combine terms. So this is our answer. Step 6 is to verify the results. We see that when x equals 0, w equals 0, and when x equals h, dw dx is 0. So we match both of the boundary conditions, and our final equation also satisfies the z-momentum equation and the continuity equation. So we verify the results. Finally, step 7 is to calculate other properties of interest. We could calculate tau at the wall, for example, which is mu dw dx at the wall. We can calculate the volume flow rate and other parameters. In the interest of time, I'm not going to do any of those. If you plot the velocity profile, namely w versus x, the profile indeed looks like what we thought it would look like. Finally, non-dimensionally, if we let x star equal x over h, and w star equal w times mu over rho g h squared, which we get by dimensional reasoning, we would get a plot that looks just like this in shape, but it would be valid for any fluid, any h, even any gravity. So that's why we often plot our results non-dimensionally. One final comment, notice that w is negative everywhere in the direction of the gravity vector. Now I'll do an example in cylindrical coordinates, namely the flow between two concentric cylinders, this inner one of radius ri and this outer one of radius r0. The fluid is a liquid with rho and mu, and it's this yellow region in this flow. The inner cylinder is rotating at angular velocity omega i, and the outer cylinder is stationary. The flow is infinite into the page. We make the usual assumptions of steady, laminar, two-dimensional Newtonian flow in the r theta plane. This flow is rotationally symmetric, which means that del del theta of anything is zero, and u theta and p pressure are functions of radius only. We also assume that ur equals zero everywhere. In other words, there's no radial flow. There's only a tangential flow, u theta. We want to find u theta as a function of r. Again, we follow our step-by-step -step procedure. Step one is to identify the flow domain in geometry. The flow domain is the yellow region in our diagram, and we have these radii as our geometry. Step two is to list assumptions, approximations, and boundary conditions. I won't read these in detail. You can read them on the annotated notes. The first one is that w equals zero, and del del z of any velocity component is zero. Two is that it's steady, so del del t is zero. Three is that ur equals zero. Four is that del del theta is zero. Five just describes the fluid, and we ignore gravity. I note here that we can have gravity in the z direction, which would be into the page in this diagram. All that would do is add a hydrostatic component of pressure, but will not affect the velocity profile at any slice at any z location. So the hydrostatic pressure distribution could be added to this without any effect on the present analysis. Our boundary conditions are no slip at both walls. At the inner wall, u theta must equal the speed of the wall, which is omega i r i. And at the outer wall, which is stationary, u theta must be zero. This is because the inner cylinder is rotating, but the outer cylinder is stationary. Step three is to list and simplify all the differential equations. Here's the continuity equation in our r theta z coordinate system. And these terms go away by approximations three, four, and one. So continuity is exactly satisfied. Now consider the r momentum equation. ur is zero by approximation three. So all of these terms go to zero everywhere we have a ur. By approximation four, nothing is a function of theta. We're ignoring gravity. But these two terms remain, so this equation simplifies to del p del r equal rho u theta squared over r. I want to take this time to say that any time you have curved flow, such as in this problem, where there's a velocity in the tangential direction, pressure has to increase radially. It's a centripetal kind of acceleration term, a centripetal, or some people call it centrifugal effect. And that's where we get this u theta squared over r term in our r momentum equation. But p is not a function of time, theta, or z. p is a function of r only. So once again, we can use total derivatives. And this is our final simplified r momentum equation. For the z momentum equation, the velocity component can be written either as w or uz. 
Assumption 1 tells us that w is 0. In other words, uz is 0, and so are its derivatives. So these terms with uz all go away. We're ignoring gravity, and pressure is not a function of z, since we're ignoring hydrostatic pressure. I comment here that we could have left these two terms in, and since everything else goes away, this would give us hydrostatic pressure in the z direction. This does not affect the rest of the problem, as I mentioned previously. Now the theta momentum equation. We simplify assumption 2, 3, 4, 1, and 3. On the right hand side, 4, 6, 4, 1, and 3. Here's a case where we want to combine these two terms to make our integration easier. In a previous lesson, we showed that these two terms combine into this one term. Since all the other terms in this equation are zero, this term has to equal zero. But since u theta is a function only of r, we again change the total derivatives. So we get this equation as our final simplified form of the theta momentum equation. Step four is to solve. We integrate and get a constant of integration c1. We multiply by r. We integrate again. r u theta is c1 r squared over 2 plus another constant of integration. Finally, we divide by r and we get u theta is c1 r over 2 plus c2 over r. This is our answer for the velocity profile, except for these unknown constants, which we solve by applying the boundary conditions, which is step 5. One of our boundary conditions was that at r equal r naught, the outer radius u theta is 0 since that cylinder is stationary, so we have 0 equals c1 r naught over 2 plus c2 over r naught. We can solve for c2 as a function of c1, c2 is negative c1 r0 squared over 2. Our other boundary condition was at the inner cylinder wall, u theta equal omega ri. So omega ri is these two terms at r equal ri, where c1 ri over 2 plus c2 over ri. But plugging in this equation for c2, we get c1 ri over 2 minus c1 r0 squared over 2 ri. We can solve this equation for c1 after a little bit of algebra. C1 is minus 2 ri squared omega i divided by r0 squared minus ri squared. And then from here, C2 is r0 squared ri squared omega i over r0 squared minus ri squared. The algebra is a little tedious but not difficult. After a little more algebra, we get our final expression for u theta. We see that it's a function of r with these other constants as parameters. Step 6 is to verify the results. I'll leave that up to the viewer. I'll sketch what this profile looks like. I'll do it at the bottom. It turns out to look something like this, where u theta is max at the inner cylinder and zero at the outer wall. Step seven is to calculate other properties of interest. In the interest of time, I'll just say that we can calculate the shear stress at the walls, the volume flow rate at a cross section, and you can calculate the torque required to rotate the inner cylinder. Once you know the shear stress, tell w at the wall. You can multiply by 2 pi ri and some depth into the page to get this total tangential force, and then the moment is another ri. So we can easily calculate the torque required to rotate this cylinder. One final comment. This solution applies for any ri and r0 values. As the gap gets very small, in other words, the difference between these two radii, and if we magnify this region, the velocity profile approaches linear. And locally, this is just like Coet flow, which we discussed in a previous lesson. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.